so welcome to tonight's presentation on uh, corporate governance and how it's relevant to startups. Um, so this is uh, a sort of a, a relatively um, high level presentation. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the details. So, for example, we'll talk a bit about their duties and go into a little bit more detail there. Um, as with all our presentations, if you've got any questions, uh, chuck them in the uh, chat box. Uh, we'll answer any questions at, at, at the very end. Um, before we start, though, a bit about us. Um, so, uh, if you've finished our presentation before, you will know this, uh, but we're the only law firm in the UK working exclusively with startups and home businesses. So, it's very much what we do. Um, I set up the firm uh, a long time ago when I had a lot more hair, uh, so probably about 13, 14 years ago now. Um, and, and, and really the idea from the very beginning uh, has been to work with startups. Um, we work with earlier stage startups, so all the way from premium corporations through to sort of series A, series B. Most of our clients are sold uh, by about sort of series B investment rounds. Um, so sort of in the 50 to, you know, 150, 200 million sort of range. Um, that's a sweet spot for us, uh, partly because it's the most exciting bit. Once, once startups get beyond that sort of series A, series B stage, um, it, they become a much, much bigger beast. They, uh, a lot of the work that lawyers do is sort of much more churn, a lot less exciting. Um, and, and we really enjoy the exciting stuff. So, um, yeah, that's about us. Um, in terms of uh, speakers today, it's myself and my colleague Catherine. So um, I started my career in two big New York law firms doing sort of half billion plus M&A. So basically buying and selling sort of listed companies. Um, it sounds incredibly glamorous. And for those of you who are old enough to remember Ali Beal. Um, you know, that kind of thing is what people tend to think about. Um, really good fun, actually, really enjoyed it. Um, but there was a point where I found myself in the office at four o'clock in the morning on a Sunday for about the 20th week in a row. I could barely remember what my bedroom looked like, uh, and I decided this probably wasn't for me. So um, back in 2011, I set up Arquits, uh, definitely with a sort of absolute objective to work with startups. Since then, as a firm, we've advised uh, over 1,600 startups in a range of different sectors. Um, outside of work, I do all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff. Um, I'm what's called an entrepreneur in residence at universities, uh, which basically means I sort of uh, uh, mentor and, 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 uh, and help their startups within their university. Um, and a couple of years ago, I wrote uh, what I have to say myself is the best book ever written, uh, Built on Rock, which is basically a sort of a, a guide for founders setting up startups as to the sort of key legal things that they need to think about. So half the book sort of thinks about the, the setup process and the legal stuff associated with that. And then the other half talks about and, and thinks about sort of investment rounds and, and how to raise an investment. So in a nutshell, that's me. Uh, Catherine, tell us about you. So I'm a corporate and commercial solicitor here at Buckworth. I joined the team about a year ago when I qualified. Um, I range, I work on a range of different um, bits and pieces of work, so the corporate and commercial bits. So corporate side is the M&A transactions and the investment rounds. Um, and then on the commercial side, ranging from commercial documents, T's and C's, um, privacy policies, um, lots of different types of clients, but mainly at the moment looking at lots of tech clients. So that's me. Cool. So in terms of what we're going to talk about, um, we're going to start just by having a think about the legal structure. So just to set the scene for the, the, the legal structures that we're thinking about here. We're then just going to have a think about what we mean by corporate governance, why it's important. Um, Catherine will then have a look at the constitutional documents, the documents that if you like sort of set out the rules of corporate governance. We'll have a think about director's duties and we will finish off uh, trying not to scare the hell out of you. Um, but thinking about the sort of the liability if you do breach your director's duties and what you can do to protect yourself. So starting at the very beginning, uh, Catherine, let's have a chat and sort of, well, talk to me about uh, legal structures. Yeah, so there are a number of different types of legal structures and um, determines how your business is going to be organised, owned, um, managed, and the type of structure you choose for your business is going to affect the rights and liabilities of the owners and the obligations on those running it um, and the consequences if things do unfortunately go wrong. Um, your business structure is also going to impact the way you can raise money um, and the legal and tax consequences for the business. So these things are really essential to consider from the outset. So you can see on the screen, we have split these into two separate types. So we've got for-profit um, and not-for-profit. So firstly, looking at the for-profit, um, so for sole traders, 
This is um, essentially you trading as yourself. Um, in simple terms, you're running and you're owning the business. And in the eyes of the law, there's no differentiation between the business itself um, and you as the individual running it. Um, but this does mean that you are personally liable for the business and for business debt. Um, so an example of this is always you run your business, um, you get into lots of debt and you can't pay. So your personal assets are up on the line. So fortunately, you hear lots of time people losing their house, for example. Um, also, sole traders pay income tax on the profits. Um, and there's no requirement for sole traders to be registered at company's house. Um, however, they must be registered as self-employed. Um, so then looking at companies limited by shares. Um, these are viewed very differently to sole traders. Um, they're separate legal entities. Um, so in the eyes of the law, the company itself um, is its own legal person. Um, and it's completely separate to those who own it and those who run it. Um, so you can see it is owned by shareholders um, and then run by the directors. Again, um, although these are separate people in practice, a lot of the time these people do overlap, especially sort of um, the early stage companies at the very start. Um, so a company pays corporation tax um, and then you've got that limited liability, um, which is the key difference here. So there's no personal liability um, for the shareholders and the directors in the same way there are sole traders. So any debt, loss, um, legal claims, for example, they're all the responsibility of the company rather than um, the ones sort of owning it, running it. Um, and then the last one you can see on there is the LLP. Um, so this is not a structure that any of our clients tend to use or, or startups, definitely not. Um, they're more commonly sort of um, professions. So here's sort of law firms, accounting firms, things like that. And so if you're looking at setting up a for-profit business, you're trying to figure out for yourself, do I want to go as a sole trader or a limited company? Um, as a sort of rule of thumb, I would say, think about what the objective is. So if you are setting up a hobby project, so uh, you're a massive fan of Tom Daly, you've got his knitting book and you're going to knit scarves and sell them to the Women's Institute, um, or maybe you're going to bake cakes and you're going to sell them at a church fair. Those sorts of things, you know, low value, low risk, um, a sole trade is perfect for that. In contrast, if you're setting up a business that's going to be your main source of, uh, of living, your, your main source of sort of earnings uh, going forwards, uh, particularly if you're going to raise investments and you want to grow and scale it, um, I would say just go straight for a company limited by shares. Um, it is possible to transition from a sole trader to a company limited by shares, but particularly if you're looking at raising investment, investors will want to claim tax relief on their investment through two schemes called SEIS and EIS. Um, there are lots of technical rules with those schemes, but a really important rule um, that applies is that substantially all of the intellectual property, so that intangible stuff that you create, you, you create a company, all of that IP needs to have been created in the company. And so if you set up a sole trader and you've taken too long before transitioning to a company limited by shares, you may run into difficulties. So I would say if you're looking at setting up a scale up and you, you want to grow in scale and raise investment, opt for a company limited by shares uh, from the get-go. So moving on to looking at the not-for-profit, the social, the social enterprise. Um, so in summary, these are the types of company that are set up with a specific social objective to serve that particular purpose. Um, they seek to maximize profits, but for, the society, for society, for the environment, for that particular purpose, and not for the, the people who are owning it, um, running it, for example. So looking at community interest companies, um, they must have a community purpose. So an example of this is a community sports club, an art center, um, they are asset locked. So what we mean by this is the assets must be retained within that CIC um, and must be used again for that same community purpose. Um, it makes it difficult if you want to get out of the CIC or to sell assets, um, as you can only do so to another asset locked body, generally speaking. So for example, charity. Um, the difficulties can arise here. Let's say um, you set up a CIC um, and then ends up, it ends up going really, really well, taking off, and you actually want to make some money for yourself. 
Um, it's really difficult at that point for the owners to then change change the way the company's set up or, for example, pay a staff member a huge salary um, or grow it into a bigger business. Um, it simply is just not as easy. Um, also, it's generally required for grant funding. So here you need to really consider the type of funding you're looking for. If you're looking um, to raise investment, you're going to be looking at the company and to buy shares. If you are going to be requiring grants, you're going to be looking at CIC. Moving on to B Corp then, so these are um, verified by B Lab um, as meeting those ESG standards. So these are the standards of social, environmental, so performance, transparency, accountability. Um, it's a voluntary opt in, um, and your doc steps essentially to make sure you're uh, making a positive um, effect for workers, customers, suppliers, um, community governance. Um, essentially, it's to build a healthier environment, reduce inequality, things like that. It is important to note, though, um, that although it's voluntary opt-in, um, the requirements are being reviewed at the moment um, for in order to become a B Corp. Um, there's a bit of a worry that this is becoming a bit of a sort of greenwashing marketing tool rather than used for the actual purpose that it's been put in place. Um, and then finally, you can see the company that's limited by guarantee. So this is a company that has no shareholders, no shares, um, meaning all the profits are retained within the business. Um, so no dividends can be paid to anyone. Um, there's no share capital. And again, it means you can't raise any capital. So in terms of, um, if you're setting up a social enterprise, what structures you use? Um, I personally um, absolutely despise CICs. Uh, and the reason is very, very simple. Um, we have so many clients who structure through a CIC who come to us um, and say, I've got this CIC, uh, you know, I've done a fantastic job, it's going really well, um, we're making loads and loads of money, but I'm living on the bread line and I really now want to either sell it and, 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 and get a huge return on exit, um, or potentially I want to pay myself a huge dividend, um, you know, so that I can, I can finally get back the fruits of, of the hard work I've put in. Um, the problem, as Catherine said, it's incredibly difficult to get out of a CIC once you're into it. And the reason is this asset lock. Um, the asset lock is locking in all the assets in the business into that CIC. You can't just get it out at, at less than market value. Um, there are some ways where you can go a little bit towards alleviating the problem, but it is super difficult. And so my message to, um, to, to founders of social enterprises is only use the CIC if you absolutely have to. And that probably means that you're entirely dependent on grant funding. If you just want to send out the message that you are a social enterprise, a B Corp is a much better way of doing it. That gives you the rubber stamp that you are complying with the SG standards, you are a social enterprise, you're thinking about making the world a better place, but it doesn't impose as many restrictions as a CIC would. So in terms of which structures you use, uh, Catherine, do you want to give us a sort of overview of, of what most of our startups do? Yeah, so for most of our startups and what we would recommend to those startups um, is the limited company. Um, there's a few reasons you can see there on the screen. Um, firstly, that limited liability. So circling back to that point that um, those running it, um, the shareholders, directors um, owning it, haven't got the same liability level. So that the company's seen as a separate person than itself. Um, there's separate tax treatment, so um, limited companies pay the corporation tax, like we said earlier, that's the 19 to 25%, um, whereas sole traders are um, looking at income tax, which we see between 20 to 45. Um, and then finally, it's easy to bring on investment and sell the business. So looking at looking in terms of investors, that um, SEIS and EIS tax um, relief only applies to limited companies. So this is the tax relief that um, investors can get if they invest in early stage companies. So startups, most of our clients. Um, and a registered limited company is seen as far more stable um, business and therefore a lot lower risk for investors. Um, and also they're, they're, they have that same protection with that limited liability. So investors are only going to lose um, as much as they put in. So looking at those things to consider, these um a few things that we always think about of clients. Um, so what the objectives in setting up the business are, um, how much control um they want over the decision making, 
how they're going to finance the business, whether it's going to be grant funding or investment, and the tax, tax implications um, of their structure and what they want an exit to look like. So that's legal structures. Um, in terms of what corporate governance is, so the Corporate Governance Institute has got a, a relatively pithy sort of definition of this. So good quality ethical decision making that builds a sustainable business and enables uh, businesses to create long term value more effectively. So in layman's terms, um, what we're thinking about is the way that uh, a company is governed and the purpose for which it exists. Um, and the key things that we're sort of looking at are who takes decisions, um, generally the directors, and how are they held accountable for the decisions that, 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 that they make. Um, and if you think about a company limited by shares, decisions are taken in the main by directors, they're held accountable by the shareholders. Um, there's a smallish list of things that out in the Companies Act where the directors need to get shareholder approval before taking a particular decision. So that's things like changing the articles, winding up the company, those sorts of things. But in general, the directors are running the company, they're taking the majority of the decisions. Um, and when you think about sort of corporate governance and, and the documentations that put it in place, um, we're really thinking about a list of policies and procedures that ensure that management, the directors, deal effectively with the challenges of running a company um, and are answerable and accountable to, to the stakeholders. So why is corporate governance important? Um, I think a lot of founders um, with a hat on as directors, they think to themselves that their primary obligation is to maximize profit. So to, to, to get to a position of profitability as fast as they can and then maximize it once they're there. And so what they're really thinking about is, is their responsibilities to shareholders and investors. The law says that that's not the only thing that you need to be thinking about. So you also need to think about your responsibilities to employees, suppliers, customers, and the local community. And if the company's in trouble, also creditors. So to give an example, um, you know, if you're operating a business, uh, you can maximize the profit by paying your employees peanuts, uh, you know, by not paying your creditors, by not paying your suppliers, um, you know, by cutting corners and causing pollution and, and damage to the local community and environment. What the law says is that that's not acceptable. You have to be able to prioritize and, and balance the objectives of all those different stakeholders. And that really is the sort of the job of the directors. Um, in terms of what, what does good corporate governance entail, there are really sort of three things here. The most important bit, and the thing that we as lawyers tend to be most involved with, is basically complying with legal obligations, so making sure you don't break the law. Um, but beyond that, uh, you've got some slightly softer stuff that, that has to be considered. So um, ESG obligations, so your obligations to comply with environmental, social, and governance rules. So if you think about a business that, I don't know, is a builder's merchant, um, you know, they have obligations to ensure that they're not polluting, that they are not, uh, you know, selling uh, products for buildings that are not sustainable, that are not going to uh, stand the test of time, that perhaps have been, uh, have got chemicals on them that, that are polluting. So thinking about those sorts of broader obligations. In the UK, um, some ESG obligations are legally mandated. So a good example would be um, modern slavery. Uh, in the UK now, now we have laws that say you cannot use state labour, you cannot use child labour, and there are positive legal obligations on, on businesses to look at their supply chains and make sure businesses that they are working with uh, are not using state labour. If you are a bigger company, you also have to publish a modern slavery policy. So that's the sort of legal obligation stuff. Similar things uh, apply in respect to pollution and, and, you know, actually increasingly in respect to environmental obligations. So, uh, from April this year, landlords can't rent out uh, commercial properties if they don't have a certain level of environmental efficiency. So this kind of stuff is, be is being legislated. Um, what you're going to see over the next five, ten years is ESG obligations becoming more and more mandatory uh, and not just optional. And then the final sort of thing that we're thinking about is compliance with processes and procedures. So a lot of corporate governance is about putting in place the right policies and procedures and making sure that primarily directors comply with them. Um, and as Catherine's going to talk about now, um, the main sort of policies and procedures and documents that we're thinking about um, are the constitutional documents of the company. Yeah, so the constitutional documents um, are the documents that you're going to have in place for the company 
um, to organise, govern, um, manage the company. You're essentially setting out the rules of the company. Um, so you can see on there, we've got the Memorandum of Association. This is essentially a bit of a tick box. It's a one pager um, and it's, it's what sets out who the initial shareholders are going to be, what that initial shareholder is going to be when you set up your company and company's house. You've then got your articles of association. These are either the standard model articles um, or they can be tailored. Um, and we'll talk about those a bit more in a minute. And then you've got your shareholders agreement, which although it's not technically a constitutional document, it's something we would definitely recommend. Um, and it needs to be complied with, it's, it's put in place. Um, again, something we'll talk about a bit more in a minute. Um, so in terms of where you're putting um, the governance provisions, um, the thing to consider is the key difference between the articles and the shareholders agreement. Um, so the articles of association, um, any failure to follow procedure in the articles makes that matter void. Um, so the difference there is that in a shareholders agreement, any failure to follow the procedure that's set out there is a um is a, a breach of contract essentially by the shareholders, but the matter um is void. So if we look at the articles of association, they are like you said, the rules that govern the company um to all and allocate powers. They are public record, so they're available on company's house. Um, include managerial, organisational uh, structure, responsibility for those running it, so that's the directors, um, and then also set out for the shareholders um, their rights, so for example their, vote, their voting, their dividend rights, exit, things like drag, tag, um, and anti-dilution points. Um, they also you can also have, like we said, the model articles, or you can amend the articles. So you can have your own set of tailored articles. Um, if you want to adopt your own articles or amend the model articles slightly, for example, you, you're going to do this because it's it's going to suit the needs of the company at the time you're doing it. Um, it's often done at sort of the first stage of investment, um, or as the company grows, the structure changes slightly. Um, or even sometimes just when the founders, the shareholders actually sit down and talk about what they want to happen. Sometimes when they take legal advice, they actually don't know what would happen in different circumstances. We can talk them through it um, and then actually they want, maybe want something slightly different. So that's why we're tailoring the articles. So the legal effect of the articles, um, they are legally required. So you have to adopt articles when you um, incorporate a company on company's house. Um, and like I said earlier, if you do breach the articles, if the company breaches the articles, then the matter is void. Um, they bind the company and its members all together, um, and they can't be illegal um, against public policy, inconsistent with court orders, um, fraudulent, or increased liability. This might sound really obvious that they can't be illegal. Um, however, when we are having these sorts of discussions, lots of clients want to disapply um, things without realizing that. Um, they're in the Companies Act or in different areas of law, and actually we can't um, obviously put anything in there that's going to be illegal or, or against something else. Um, so how to amend your articles? Um, you can amend your articles by special resolution. So what this means is 75% of the shareholders by their shareholder need to um, approve, must agree to them. They're then sent to um, Companies House um, with a copy of that special resolution. Um, but if you are going to sort of tailor your articles, amend them um, by special resolution, always take some legal advice you can and ensure that what you're changing is appropriate for your company and you're providing adequate protection, they're clearly drafted. If anything's sort of unclear, it can cause lots of confusion down the line. So moving on to the shareholders agreement then. So this is a contract between the shareholders um, and the company itself. It regulates the relationship between the shareholders, each other and the company. Um, similar to the articles, they're there to sort of manage operations, um, regulate, set out rights. Um, however, they are a private, this is a private contract, so it's not available on company's house. Um, this is just something that the shareholders put together themselves. 
Um, the articles and shareholders agreement do quite often overlap. Obviously, like we've talked about, they have similar sorts of things in them, but it is essential to make sure they don't conflict. Um, otherwise, again, it can cause confusion, I'm not sure what, what the intention was. If you're looking to amend your shareholders agreement, then by default, um, every party has to sign the same way if you enter into any agreement or parties are signing it. However, if you already have a shareholders agreement in place, there may be a variation clause in there, which um, allows a certain percentage of the shareholders to sign. Um, but this is still quite often or should be still relatively high. So in terms of director's duties, um, director's duties come in the first place directly from the Companies Act, so the governing legislation, and they're listed out in section 171 to 177. And then they also come from um, a bunch of other legislation, uh, some secondary legislation and some sort of, uh, if you like, guidance and, and notes. So the, the thing that we are most concerned about is the duties in the Companies Act. You can see these listed on the, the top half of the, of the slide. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'll, I'll just pick out a couple that are, are generally sort of most relevant. So the, the first one I'll pick out is the duty to promote success of the company, taking into account the interests of all the stakeholders. So we touched on this earlier, but what you are required to do as a director is ensure that you are maximizing the long-term success of the business whilst taking into account the um, interests of all of the stakeholders. So when you are thinking about, for example, entering into uh, a, a transaction with a customer, you need to be thinking about your ability to make a profit for the company in the long term, um, distinguished, by the way, from making a short-term profit. You're thinking, or you should be thinking about long-term success for the business. You know, how does this protect the interests of employees? How does it... Uh, you know, protect the interest of creditors if you have them. So thinking about those sorts of long-term interests is super important. Um, you have to avoid conflicts of interest. So to give an example, um, and this actually comes up more often than you, than you might expect, let us imagine that you uh, are a director of company A, uh, and company A is a business that, um, you know, provides training to, let's say it's even a CIC, uh, it provides training to uh, young people from deprived backgrounds. It helps them get a job. So that's company A. In company B, uh, you also have a training business, which provides uh, sort of one-to-one -one tuition uh, and, and career guidance to people who are paying for it. So your social enterprise, you provide the stuff for free. Perhaps you're getting uh, grant funding from local authorities to provide those services. Company B, you're providing very much the same services, but you're charging for you can probably see that there's a big risk there of a conflict of interest because you have a customer who comes to you. Uh, you might say to yourself, well, I can, or, or you might ask the question, can I get away with charging them my fees in company B? Or do I want to provide the services for free and get the local authorities to pay me the fees? And, you know, you're going to have different competing objectives there depending on, on, on the customer and what they're trying to achieve. Um, as a director, your obligation is to, in all circumstances, avoid potential conflicts of interest. So you shouldn't get yourself into the position I just described in the first place. If there is a conflict of interest, then you have to declare that conflict of interest to your fellow directors. Um, and then your articles of association will set out what happens next. So some articles will say, if you have declared a conflict of interest, you can continue to act in respect of the conflicted transaction and take part in decision making. Other articles will say that you can't do that. Um, super important though, that, that you're aware of conflicts of interest, you avoid them where you can, and if for some reason you can't avoid the conflict, you declare it. So that's the sort of Companies Act uh, director's duties. You then have a bunch of duties that arise from secondary legislation. So we touched on some of those earlier. So the example I gave um, uh, was ensuring that you, um, you know, that you pay people a fair wage, uh, that you pay the minimum wage, uh, that you don't have circumstances of modern slavery. So that's a legal obligation that, that you have to comply with. Um, an area where directors need to be very much increasingly aware is around the sort of financial um, uh, sanctions, money laundering and terrorist financing obligations. So if you go back five, six years ago, primarily these were the concern of, of lawyers, accountants, banks to worry about this kind of stuff. 
And directors could, within reason, pretty much ignore it and, and, and not get too worried about it. That has changed. So the, the Ukraine war meant that the British government passed a whole raft of sanctions. And indeed, they passed sanctions uh, and updated sanctions legislation uh, pretty much constantly during the last couple of years. Um, if you or your company breach sanctions rules, you as the director commit a criminal offence. And the government take these things incredibly seriously. So you must ensure that you comply with sanction rules. And by the way, that basically means that you cannot, or your company cannot do business with, for example, businesses uh, that are residents in Russia, uh, except in very limited circumstances. So you need to be aware of this kind of stuff. What's coming down the line potentially is actually uh, is legal legislation that make money laundering offences the responsibility of directors as well. So some legislation currently going through Parliament will impose tipping off offences on directors uh, and, and, and effectively actually avoidance offences uh, on, on directors for both money laundering and fraud. So what that will mean if that, that legislation is passed is that directors will, will be liable to ensure that people that they do business with are not laundering money and are not committing uh, fraudulent crimes. So that's going to be something new that essentially will come in. So this kind of stuff is director's duties and something that you as directors must comply with. The, the final thing I want to talk about very briefly was just wrongful training. So what this means, this is the circumstance where a company continues to incur liabilities in circumstances where the directors knew or should have known that the company wasn't going to be able to pay off those liabilities. Um, 10, 20 years ago, uh, what, as, as a rule of thumb and a bit of a joke, you could tell if a business was about to go bust because the directors would suddenly pop up driving Ferraris, Porsches, Rolls Royces. And what they've done is they've basically gone and got higher purchase agreements in the name of the company uh, that enabled them to drive these cars. And they did them in circumstances where they knew damn well the company was going to go bust. Um, as a result of some fairly flagrant abuses of this kind of stuff, the government changed the law quite dramatically in the 2006 Companies Act, 2016 Companies Act, um, and has basically outlawed that kind of behaviour. Now, for our clients, um, the area where this tends to be of most concern uh, is when they're raising an investment round, but they've run out of cash. So at the point they're raising the round, they can't afford to pay their debts as they fall due. They are therefore technically insolvent. And the question the directors need to ask themselves is, do they believe as they continue to trade and continue to incur liabilities that the company will be able to pay them off? And the way that generally they get comfortable with that is by saying, well, yes, we are raising a round. We absolutely think this round is going to complete. Once that round completes, we're going to have a load of money in our bank account. We're going to be solvent again, and we're going to pay off our liabilities. So that's how directors get comfortable with this. Um, but just to be clear, if directors do incur liabilities in circumstances where they should have known they won't be able to pay them off, and the company subsequently goes bust, they may have personal liability for this kind of stuff. So it is important to be aware of the risks here and to protect yourself, which is something that Catherine will talk about uh, in a second. So without scaring the hell out of Catherine, uh, do you want to run us through what can happen if you breach your director's duties? Yeah, so like Mike said, this can be a particularly scary topic um, and it's something that a lot of our clients focus on a lot. Um, However, it is important to note that although we're going to sort of run through the consequences, um, these types of the, the breach of duty claims are quite uncommon. Um, they're com really com complicated, uh, expensive, and they can have serious consequences, obviously not only for the director, um, but also for the company, um, their reputation, future investment, for example. So. It isn't something that we see all the time, but it is definitely something that you should be aware of. Um, so what happens if a director does breach their duty? There's a few different consequences. So criminal offences, um, some duty breaches are considered so serious that they are criminal offences. They can result in large fines, prison sentences, um, directors can be disqualified, removed from office, um, so it can be temporary or permanently. Um, and this is obviously in, in serious, serious circumstances. So we're looking at sort of fraud and things like that. 
Um, looking at personal liability, so directors can be held personally liable um, to the shareholders and creditors for certain breaches um, of their duties. Um, this will usually be brought by the company who are seeking to recover their damages um, for financial loss, but you can see that um, shareholders, creditors and or liquidators can also sue the directors personally. Normally, depending on the type of misconduct, the type of breach um, will depend on the type of claim that's brought, the type of um, consequences. So we're looking here at damages. Um, this is where uh, you're suing the director for their breach and it's caused the company financial loss. Um, so they are ordered to pay money back to the company to compensate them for that loss. Um, restitution of profits. This is where um, a director's breach has caused them a gain. So they've made a particular profit from what they've done um, and they are ordered to pay that money back to the company. Um, injunctive relief. So this is where a company can or whoever can bring the claim against that director um, and it can then stop them continuing to do that breach. So the classic example here is um, all the directors falling out, um, one going completely rogue, sending all the company secrets, confidential information to all their clients, um, all their competitors, fail to um, stop when they're asked to, and the company is uh, almost forced to bring a claim um, for an injunction, which then stops them continuing to breach their duties. Um, if there is an injunction put in place, there's criminal implications for a breach, which are a lot more serious. Um, and then you finally got the decision of a contract. So this is where um, the director signs a contract, um, contrary to what the company's intentions were, um, and this can be reversed. There's also there the corporate liability to consider. So where directors have breached their duties, um, you also think about the consequences for the company. So the company might become liable to customers, creditors, and shareholders um, because of that director's wrongdoing. So it's it's important to consider not only the consequences for that director themselves, but for the company as well. So how to protect yourself from such liability? Um, we split it into three different sections here. So firstly, insurance. Um, directors and officers liability insurance, um, the same with all insurance, they protect you from civil liability but not criminal, so you commit serious fraud and your insurance is not going to help you out. Um, preparation, review the documents, the constitutional documents we discussed earlier and understand the process in them that needs to be followed understand your rights and responsibilities under them, um, your expectations as a director, um, and consider sort of the current law, what's, what's, what you need to keep be kept up to date on and what you need to continuously carry out training on, for example, to make sure you are up to date on those things. And then looking at um, process. So follow the correct process and always, always record um, the process. Day to day, it's easy to forget to keep written records of things, put it to the, top, the bottom of your to-do list, think it's not very important, forget to ever do it, and all of a sudden you've got six months without any written records of any decisions that have been made. Um, if there is an issue, also report it to the board. Um, it's a lot easier to um, report decisions at the time than have to go back and explain why you didn't. Um, director's decisions are recorded in a board minute, um, and anything that you need the shareholders approval for is going to be in the form of a written resolution itself. This will either be a special resolution um, or ordinary resolution, and it'd be fine with the company's house, so that will depend on the decision you're making. Um, as a general rule, we do say if you didn't record your process, you didn't do it. So I think that's a really important and key thing to stick by. And I think that, that really is the key of all of this. Um, it's it's very easy, I think, where things start to go wrong for directors to think to themselves, well, I don't want to record this, I don't want to put stuff in writing because that sort of in their head evidences that things are going wrong. It's absolutely the wrong way to think about it. Um, the way that you protect yourself uh, if things are going wrong, if you're put in a difficult position or perhaps you know, you're know you concerned about trading loss and solvent, 
the way to protect yourself is to hold a board meeting, put it in writing, and explain the logic of what you're doing. So I don't think I'm breaching my director's duties because X, Y, Z, or we don't think we're trading insolvent because ABC. If you do that and you do it contemporaneously, uh, and somebody takes a copy later, well, you've got that defense in writing that you thought about it and you thought you were doing the right thing. Uh, if you didn't put it in writing, uh, what you say you thought about is is simply your word. And the chances are, if something has gone obviously wrong, that people are just not going to believe you. So put it in writing. Uh, and if things do go wrong, we are concerned about stuff, speak to a lawyer. That's what we're there for. Uh, and hopefully we can we can solve the problem and, and, and stop you worrying. Um, in a sec, we'll take some questions, uh, but just a little bit about uh, the next presentation that we're doing. Uh, this one's actually uh, going to be an in-person event uh, at the Clarence Centre, which is part of the South Bank University's campus uh, down in Borough. Um, we're going to talk about founders agreements uh, with a little bit of thinking about sort of what they are and why do you need them. Um, so, you know, the things we're going to think about are yeah, what they are, what must be included in founders agreements, the stuff that we always put in there, what may be included, the stuff that sometimes we put in there, sometimes we don't. Uh, and a little bit of sort of flagging of the, the sort of common problems that, that we find. So um, we're going to move on to questions. Uh, if you do have any questions, chuck them in the uh, chat box and Ivan here will ask away. So Ivan, have we got any questions so far? Yes, perfect. Thank you so much for the super insightful presentation, guys. It was really helpful. Uh, we've got a few questions. As Michael said, feel free to share your questions in the chat box. I'm going to read them and Catherine and Mike are going to answer them. And our first question tonight is from Albert. Albert is asking, are big corps really social enterprises or is it just greenwashing? Yeah, so, I mean, this is, there's been a lot of debate about this recently, um, with lots of people sort of pointing to the fact that some slightly unexpected businesses are B Corp. So, you know, there's a couple of law firms who are B Corps. I think there's even an oil company that's B Corp. And, you know, don't get me wrong, uh, it's more than possible that they're prioritizing uh, sort of social purposes, but it does seem a little bit uh, odd to some people. Um, as Catherine said earlier, the, the, the B Corp organization are actually reviewing their, their rules and regulations to, to try to make them a little bit more robust and to try to build a little bit more faith into, into the process that's followed. What I would say, uh, certainly from my experience, I, I think most registered B Corps genuinely do have a social purpose and that they are run by people who really are looking to make the world a better place. Um, sure, there are some people who are abusing it and using it as a marketing tool, um, but I think in the main, you know, people aren't greenwashing, they are there for the right reasons. And, um, you know, hopefully if people sort of strengthen the, the process a little bit, it will make it, you know, that little bit better and that little bit stressful. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, the next question is from Fran. Can you convert a sole trader into a limited company? Um, so the short answer is yes, you can. Um, however, if you're thinking about doing so, you should do so as soon as possible. Um, it also needs to be tax neutral. Um, so steps are late, let HMRC know, um, form a limited company, transfer the sole trade business over to that limited company, set up the business bank account um, in your new company's name. Perfect. Thank you so much, Catherine. We also have a question from Marco. If articles of association and shareholders agreements overlap, can you just put everything into one of them and dispense the other one? <laughs> so we wouldn't recommend doing this. Um, for obviously the reasons we discussed earlier, they um, do have differences. Um, and that key difference being with if they there's a breach of them. So Mike always likes to use the example to people um, that you have a desert island, say, um, and you're, you're on a desert island. If you leave that island um, and you'll be eaten by all the sharks um, and <laughs> you basically, this is your article, so you simply can't leave. And if you do, um, you'll die. So this is the art tools. If you do something outside the art tools, the issue is void. Um, however, if you stay on the island, there's still certain rules that are in place. So the things that you have to follow, for example, what which trees you're allowed to cut down. Um, 
if you breach the, those rules of the island, then um, there might be consequences for you. However, what you did, for example, cut down a tree has still happened. So these are the rules that are in the shareholders agreement. But so in summary, the, the reasons for different breaches, um, we would definitely recommend you have both. Um, also, if you're looking to sort of raise investment, um, VCs in particular will almost always um, make, make you have both. Perfect. Thank you so much. That was really good comparison, Catherine. Um, I'm going to take just three extra questions. I can see lots of questions, guys. But again, uh, if we are not able to answer all of them, feel free to shoot an email to Catherine and Michael. And I'm pretty sure that they'll be happy to continue the conversation with you over an email. Um, we've got a question from Aisha. How can I get my business out of a CIC? Yeah, so I mean, this is going back to what we were talking about earlier. So it is very difficult um, because of that asset lock. What sometimes people do is to set up another company, and as long as they can distinguish very clearly between what the CIC does and what the other company does, you may be able to uh, sort of contract in, in your other company. So, to give an example, uh, I mean, maybe give the example I had earlier. So, you've got your CIC that is providing training to disadvantaged young people. You've got your private company, which is providing uh, career training to, um, you know, business people who have got a bit more cash. Um, if you can clearly distinguish between those two businesses, then it might be that you can direct uh, sort of training clients that might otherwise have gone to the CIC uh, to the to the for profit company, um, and, and vice versa. But the problem is this point about directors' duties and conflicts of interest. Um, you're trading a very very fine line. Um, and it's not really an advisable thing to do. Sometimes what people will do is they will not be a director of the, you know, call it the for-profit company. They'll have a different director who's running it. Uh, and that sort of reduces some of the risk on, on conflict of interest. But, you know, you're in slightly risky territory here. Uh, my personal view is if, you know, at the point you set up the business, really, really think carefully about whether CIC is right. And if you don't need it, don't do it. Just use a standard for profit. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, the following question is from Vat. Do shareholders agreements need to be signed with witnesses? Yeah, so an agreement generally will need to be signed uh, with a witness if it's a deed. Um, and what makes it need to be a deed is if there's no consideration, so there's nothing sort of going back and forth, no, no cash. Um, and if there's a power of attorney in there as well, so you're giving someone else the power to do something on your behalf, or if you're waiving rights, someone's waiving their rights. Um, so a shareholders agreement will often not have any consideration um, and will often contain a power of attorney. So yes, it will be a deed and it will need to be witnessed. Perfect. Thank you so much, Catherine. And I've got one final question and uh, I'm going to ask it. It's from me. And the question is, what is the difference between a shareholders agreement and founders agreement, guys? Well, Ivan, funny you ask that question because it's a very timely question. Uh, so, as I said, our, our next session is on founders agreement. So if that was a burning question that you, that you had in your head as well, I'll definitely come along to that one. Um, in, in answer to it, I mean, a founder's agreement is a shareholder's agreement, in essence. Uh, the difference tends to be the people who are signed up to it. So founder's agreements tend to be just between the founders, and they tend to regulate things like, you know, the vesting, the early stage decision making, what happens if one of them, you know, quits, loses interest, gets fired. So it tends to be that sort of founder-centric stuff. Whereas a shareholder's agreement, uh, in an ideal world, is an agreement to which every single shareholder of the company is signed up to. And it tends to be put in place when you raise investment or when you've got other sort of shareholders coming on board. So in principle, very similar things, but with slightly different instances. Founders agreement earlier, shareholder agreement a little bit later. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, thank you, Catherine, as well. That was super helpful. Thank you for your time and the presentation tonight. Again, as mentioned, if you have any extra questions, feel free to email Michael and Catherine, and they will be happy to assist, or we can always set up a call. Uh, guys, make sure that you also follow us on social media. We are super active on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Our lawyers always share lots of relevant content to the startup world, lots of articles and insights that will be helpful for us so just hit us a follow and um 
Michael Buckworth uh, published a book uh, two years ago, uh, Built on Rock. Uh, the book is currently available to download on Amazon. Um, on Kindle, we are running a special promotion. The book is currently only 10 pounds and we've got only nine copies available. So make sure that you grab, grab your copy until we still have them on uh, Amazon. And uh, as Michael mentioned, our next event is on Founders Agreement, 28th of um, September, Thursday. Uh, it's a lunchtime event between one and two, and it's in collaboration with uh, LSB University. So make sure that you grab your tickets. Thank you so much and good night.